anyway, anyway, uh, Dugos, um, thanks for uh, putting together your thesis defense and seminar today. I'm looking forward to it. Um, you've done a lot of work despite us having a lot of challenges with COVID and um, going to nursing school, family, both of us had family life issues kind of thing. So it's been quite a, a challenge, but we're here. <laughs> and I'm really impressed with all the hard work you did. Um, I know you, you did a lot of great work on your thesis, um, considering all the, you know, everybody knows what that was like to go through the pandemic. So thanks um, for being here today and making this happen. And we're looking forward to your seminar. Let me go ahead and pass you over the host control. Um, and then you can then we can see your title. All right. And then hopefully you can share the screen, okay? Yeah. All right, so um, she did a project um, that you're about to hear about looking at the fall armyworm feeding on tomato plants that were treated with different types of fertilizers. This was um, in part a collaboration with Dixon, but she used a different species of caterpillars and so forth. So she has some really interesting findings, I think, that I think will could lead to a publication, especially if we can just do a little bit more here or there on it. Let me go ahead and minimize myself. I do go. Take it away. Okay. All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Adigo and graduate student in the Department of Biology. So I carried out um, my study under the mentorship of Professor Mosser. And um, my thesis was basically. Uh, studying like the fall army one caterpillar interactions with different fertilizers so on tomato leaves and a little bit of cannibalism. So this is the introduction. So tomato plants are basically vegetables and um, very rich in minerals. They're very succulent. Um, in biology, they would have describe them as succulent fruits because um, of their mineral content. They also contain different vitamins like vitamin C, which is ascorbic acid, vitamin D, and vitamin E. Then also tomato plants have lycopene, which um, we know gives it the characteristic color, which is red. And then it has phenolics, it has flavonoids, and all these are antioxidants, which are needed by the body. So um, basically what it what those antioxidants in tomato does is to um, fight um, the free radicals that result of like oxidation reactions that take place in our body. And that way they sort of protect, you know, the human body from breaking down and stuff like that. Then um, aside that um, a lot of countries actually depend on tomato you know, as a means of growing their, um, their finances. Um, some countries like Mexico, I know, and I think the, the United States too, because I know Florida actually like produces tomato plants like in very large quantities. But on the other hand, like some countries are not at par when it comes to like um, tomato and um, cultivation and production, you know, for economic value, like export value, so to say. And because um, it's rich in minerals, you know, a lot of scientists like use it as a model crop, you know, to check for, um, to carry out genetic studies. So some of the genetic studies they do probably is to see if there's a way they could um, make the tomato fruits to ripen on, 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 on a very short period. Some of them would want to make them like maybe less attractive to pets. Some would want to maybe like reduce the size. Some of the studies maybe like will be targeted at making the tomato to have like a longer shelf life after it's harvested. So um, caterpillars were used for this study. And, you know, I would say the feed on 
tomato leaflets. So for this study, I used um, the Follami one, which is sort of Dera frugicada. So this caterpillar is a plant eating caterpillar. Um, so it feeds on the leaves of the caterpillar and begins to bore holes on the leaves of the caterpillar. Now this caterpillar actually has like, its life cycle is in four stages, like um, the egg, where it then matures to the larva and then the pupa, then finally you get it out of caterpillar, which is like a moth. So, um, but the larval instars are in about um, six to seven stages before it finally matures to a pupa and then finally to the adult caterpillar. And generally their life cycle sort of varies depending on the season, because um, we did a study in the summer and Generally, within that period, you would expect them to grow um, within 30 days. And then when, um, during winter, when the temperatures get colder, it's going to take a longer period of time for the caterpillars to mature, probably like 80 to 90 days. So um, some studies have also shown like, because they're an economic pest and always feed on tomato. I think this is the major problem tomato production has like on a large scale, like having to deal with this pest. And so um, some studies have shown that if it's possible to um, control um, the metamorphosis from the fifth to sixth level in start to the pupal stage, then we could be able to curb um, the issues we have with caterpillars. So now if we are trying to um, reduce the incidence of pests and tomato leaves, then much a lot of studies should be focused on the fifth to the sixth level instead because those are the um, that's the period where they cause like lots of damage to the tomato plants. They reduce the quality, reduce the value, nutritional value, and everything. So now um, basically naturally, not just plants, even animals and humans like each time we're exposed to something that is foreign to our body, we always want to like trigger a defense. So in humans, you would say um, the immune system does that job. And then for plants, it's a different mechanism. So naturally, what would happen like in humans, if you're exposed to, let me say, um, the flu, depending on how strong or weak the person's immune system is, um, you would see the person maybe responding to that foreign antigen, which is the flu virus now, maybe by coughing or developing a high temperature. And all that is a way the body like tries to um, fight the virus or fight that foreign antigen in quotes and then, you know, stay healthy. So the only time it breaks down is when it overpowers the immune system and the body as well. So the same thing applies to plants. So when caterpillars begin to feed on plants, they immediately trigger defenses. So it's it could be mechanical, like or it could be chemical defenses, but it's just natural for living things, you know, to want to pro protect themselves and to protect their own. And plants will do that immediately. They are fed upon by caterpillars. So now, when caterpillars feed on plant leaves, basically what it does is it begins to trigger like these chemical pathways in plants. Plants will want to get into that defense mode and like try to wait off, you know, the pests from feeding on them. And when they do that, like they sort of like um, trigger cycles, like or pathways, like the jasmonic acid. And the jasmonic acid basically is going to do like um, trigger some plant genes which are responsible for fighting off, um, fighting off or rather discourage the caterpillar from feeding of them, like sort of making the plants less attractive to the caterpillar. And when caterpillar isn't able to feed on those plants because of their listed plant defense, what it's going to mean is that they're not going to feed well, they're not going to get um, the right amount of nutrients they would need, you know, to grow or, you know, to add weight or whatever it is. So they're not going to get that. So also in plants, you also have a, the salicylic acid pathway. And it sort of does the opposite of what jasmonic acid does, like the antagonists, so to say, that's how I like to remember them. And what it does here is that it kind of upregulates like the growth in caterpillars because salicy uh, salicylic acid does not um, 
um, trigger those genes that jasmonic acid will do that would, you know, weed off the caterpillars, you know, from feeding on those plants. So um, you will see that caterpillars and also other um, pests that would feed on plants would, would grow slowly because what the um, pathways or the genes would do is to alter the um, digestive system. They sort of like disrupt it and alter the digestive processes. So whatever it is they are getting or they, are, or they think they are getting from the plants, they are not actually getting it because their digestive um, process has been interrupted and they're not gonna get the right amount of nutrients in both which they are supposed to get from the plants they are feeding on. So um, for fertilizers, we um, farmers generally use fertilizers for various reasons. Um, you use fertilizers to improve yield, to increase um, fertility, soil fertility. You add fertilizers to improve soil quality, to improve the soil texture, and also at the same time to increase yield of crops, you know, or desired crops, depending on what the farmer, farmer's plan is. So we have various types of fertilizers. We have the organic fertilizers, and then we have the inorganic fertilizers. Yeah. Excuse me. So for um, the organic fertilizers, uh, I, I refer to them as naturally occurring fertilizers, something you can get from your backyard, you can get from your kitchen, you can get from your garden, for one, maybe like has little poultry at the backyard. These are all sources or ways you can get organic fertilizers. So you can get that from, um, animal dung, you can get that from poultry droppings, you can even get it from your kitchen, like food waste, instead of discarding that, you know, right out to be taken by the garbage truck, you can actually like sort of have like little compost bits where you would put, you know, the food waste that you have and then let that all degrade by bacteria and then you can use that to fertilize your plants. And um, for this study, um, the blood meal and the bone meal are organic fertilizers that we used for this study. And then for inorganic fertilizers, they are basically the NPK fertilizers. So what they will contain nitrogen, they will contain phosphorus and potassium. So you want to see them as artificial or synthetic fertilizers. Also, um, some scientists will want to classify fertilizers as slow release or quick release. So for slow release, um, as the name is like, it means that the nutrients contained in that fertilizer are slowly released to the plants. Like they take their time getting to the plants. So um, um, they are not being released at a very fast rate. But for quick release fertilizers, as the name suggests, it means that the plants are getting those nutrients like almost immediately. So I try to see it this way that, um, for instance, let's say for this study, oh no, let me use that. let me use an example rather. So um, if naturally, if you plant, let me say a flower and it's supposed to attain a height of, let me say 12 cm in five days naturally, um, and then you use a quick release fertilizer. So what's going to happen is that that flower is going to attain the same height, but like in a lesser number of days. So that's what the quick release fertilizers would do. Now, another problem with them is because, you know, since they're readily available to plants, they are easily leached and washed away, unlike the slow release fertilizers that, you know, gently make available the nutrients to the plants. So now, um, fertilizers and every sort of like, sort of like they work hand in hand to an extent. So, um, one second. Okay, so what happens is um, for uh, tomato plants that have like low oxygen, uh, sorry, low nitrogen content, you know, they're fertilized with, um, they're fertilized with fertilizer that have a low nitrogen content. So what that implies is that they are not going to get the right amount of nutrients or you know nitrogen they would need you know to flourish you know to get very healthy leaves you know just to attain that optimal growth which they're supposed to have so now when um because of that low level 
of nitrogen. What it means is that their growth isn't going to be as elaborate as those that would have adequate levels of nitrogen. Um, I would sort of say it's stunted. And so because it's stunted, you, it means the plant has lesser nutrition, you know. So do uh, caterpillars that would want to feed on that wouldn't get the right amount of nutrients they would need while they're feeding on that plant. And because they have a lower leaf nutrition, like they have lower nutrition being made available to them because of the nitrogen content, what it does naturally for them is that it's going to make them trigger defenses immediately, like just get into that defense mode, like trying to protect themselves and everything. Then on the other hand, like um, when you have excess amounts is also a problem. So having excess amounts, not just for fertilizers, I think basically for everything, even in life, food, water and everything, like taking excess amounts actually causes its own problems. And so in tomatoes, when you fertilize them with um, fertilizers that have a higher or excessive nitrogen content, because I know every plant like has, requires an optimum amount of different elements to thrive. And when it is low, when it exceeds is a problem for the plant. It could be good or it could be to the advantage of the plant or it could be to the disadvantage of the plant. So in this case now, when um, you have that in excess, what it means, of course, like the plant is going to grow, leaves are looking very green, fruits are attractive, you know, it looks attractive to the pests, so to see. So what's going to happen is that you see the caterpillars um, feeding and flourishing on those plants. And it takes some time for the plants, you know, to realize that they are being attacked on like the ones that have the lower um, nitrogen content. It's going to take those plants like sometimes actually, refer, oh yeah, I'm being fed upon by a predator. Oh, I need to act, you know, go into that defense mode, you know, and everything. So that's the downside to having excess amounts of nitrogens. So um, as I mentioned earlier, I did a little bit of cannibalism and I'm gonna explain this more in my materials and method, but we tried to um, see, we could see a bit of cannibalism in caterpillars. And so basically what cannibalism means is like, you know, where um, in the face of, um, scarcity, you know, of nutrients, water, air, not just caterpillars, but basically even humans, plants would want to like, you know, they start competing for the very available one that they have, you know, in this in the space or in the light of scarcity. So what they do is like the little that is, a, is available within that geographic area, you will see the population um, competing for that and what's going to lead is to competition and it's going to get to a point where those resources aren't going to be available anymore and what happens at that time is that you see them feeding on themselves so I would say it's more like survival of the fittest like whoever wins this race so on the other hand like because the aim now like tomato basically is that like we want to make sure like we control you know economic pests basically in agriculture I think that's the major aim, you know, of every agri um, agricultural study, like finding a ways to like control pests and everything. So cannibalism like is an advantage to, um, is an advantage in agriculture because what it means is that the predator is now feeding on itself and now the plant is free from every form of pest and flourishing and growing. So that's why cannibalism benefits um, the plants but get rid of the caterpillars or any species that are involved. So now to my materials and method. So um, for the materials and method, we um, purchased tomato seedlings and they were about 10 weeks old. And then what we did was to um, also get some soil, um, like the basic garden soil, which we used so we put those um, soils like in different pots, about 20 pots. And then what we did was to label them depending on the treatment which we wanted to put in that pot. So we made sure that um, we didn't um, fertilize the plants until after 24 hours to avoid 
plants, plant shop, and then we try to create replicates. Um, one second. So now um, for the tomato plants, we made sure that we fertilized them for 10 weeks before we started doing our experiments. And also we made sure to water the plants on a daily basis in the greenhouse. Then after 10 weeks, when the, um, the plants were grown and we're ready to start our experiments, we um, measured um, the heights you know, of the different plants depending on the treatment we used. We took note of the number of fruits and we also um, took note of um, the number of leaflets you will find for each treatment. And then after we were done taking note of that, we proceeded to wounding the leaves and doing that we used a pair of scissors, you know, to like mechanically damage the plants and sort of like pre-triggering the plants like, oh yeah, like you're being eaten. So that's like sort of like elicit caterpillar, you know, feeding on them. And we did that by using a pair of scissors. And when we did that, we finally harvested the leaves for the wounded category because what we did was, well, yeah, what we did was before we started wounding those leaves, like after taking note of the height, the number of fruits and the number of leaflets. So we um, separated them into two groups and we wounded one part. So the part we wounded was called the wounded leaves and the ones that weren't wounded, we called the non-wounded leaves. And what we wanted to do was to check um, caterpillar and um, to check um, plant responses like when caterpillars begin to feed on the wounded leaves and then the non-wounded leaves. And then for um, the caterpillars, um, we purchased them and then we fed them on an artificial corn diet in the laboratory. And after doing that, like putting them on the corn diet, what we did was to place them in that incubator is the 14, 10 hour light back cycle. And we just made sure the temperature was about right. Funny enough, the first time we did this, um, it didn't turn out well because like, the temperature was too high and till the caterpillar. So we had to do the experiment over again and then made sure that the temperature was just about right to allow them to grow. So um, the fertilizers we used for this study um, are the blood meal, the bone meal, which are both organic fertilizers, and then the miracle brew, which is a synthetic fertilizer and inorganic fertilizer. So um, this table shows um, the nitrogen and phosphorus content of the fertilizers we used in each study. And this contents are in grams. So if you look at the blood meal, you will see that the nitrogen content is 12 grams, and then it has no phosphorus. The bone meal has, um, sorry, the bone meal has two grams and then 14 grams of phosphorus. And then the miracle Brew has the highest amount of, of nitrogen, which is 24, and then eight grams of phosphorus. I'm going to come back to this table later. You already mentioned this. So after um, taking notes of the plant height, that's after 10 weeks of fertilization, we took note, we used a ruler to take note of the height of the plants in CN. We counted the number of leaflets, we counted the number of fruits per plant. And then we also um, checked the weight of the caterpillar. So what I did for this caterpillar, which was um, before, um, we started um, feeding the caterpillars, um, we started feeding the caterpillars with those leaves. Um, we randomly checked their weight first, and then we started growing them. And because I wanted to check for cannibalism, you know, to see if we could see some forms of cannibalism in this study, what I did, um, what I did later on was to make sure that after I created like my replicates, like transferring caterpillars to each replicate that's for each treatment. And we're supposed to, um, so I would check then I checked the number of caterpillars we had in each solo crop after 24 hours. I checked again at 48 hours and then I checked again at 72 hours. So those are my results. So this table shows the average number of leaflets, average number of fruits, 
an average height for the tomato plants that we used. So if you look at the blood meal, you would see um, the average number of leaflets is 159.4. Excuse me. For the bone meal, 140.4. Miracle grow is 94. And then we have the lowest for the unfertilized control. And this was our basis for comparison to make to see if there's an effect or if there wasn't any effect in, in our study. So the unfertilized control basically was just them feeding on leaves that were not fertilized. And then um, for the average number of fruits, blood meal had an average of 2.4, bone meal and miracle go grow had three, and then the unfertilized control had two. For the average height, um, blood meal recorded 67 centimeters, bone meal 60.6 centimeters, miracle grow is 56 centimeters, and then the unfertilized control was 54.4 centimeters. So this um, figure shows um, the average number of leaves that I, average number of leaflets rather that were harvested or rather counted from the treatments, including the ones without fertilizer. So, um, so um, if we look here at this bar, you would see that blood meal from the table, of course, like had higher number of leaflets, or if you're, Looking at it statistically, it doesn't look, um, there's an overlap between the blood meal and the bone meal. And there's um, a little bit of overlap between this, but there is none between the unfertilized control compared to the other ones with the blood meal and the bone meal. And that's some um, shows like a bit of statistical like significance. So naturally you would expect um, tomato plants fertilized with organic fertilizers like the blood meal and bone meal in this case, like to actually have, and even the miracle grow, yes, to actually have like a higher number of leaflets compared to the unfertilized control. And we could see that playing out here, but statistical significance, like you see there's an overlap. So like between blood meal and bone meal, you would say, mm, there's not really much of a difference. And between bone meal and the miracle grow, you could see a bit of significance, like a difference, but it's actually obvious when you compare your fertilized control to the bone meal and um, to the blood meal. And this is the average height of plants. So you would see here um, in centimeters, you would see for the blood meal, the bone meal, miracle grow, without fertilizer, there was no statistical significance like, in the average height of plants that received this various treatments after 10 weeks. And then to my caterpillars. So here, this figure shows the average weight of caterpillars. Um, that fed on the two categories of leaves that we had, which was the non-wounded and then wounded leaves, which were mechanically done using a pair of scissors. So um, right here, this key shows my non-wounded and this one shows the non-wounded. So now if we look across the treatments, you would see um, if we're comparing the non-wounded now, you would see that there's no, there's an overlap in the error bars for blood meal and bone meal, the same thing for miracle grow. But you could see a difference, like there's no overlap between the miracle grow and the control which had no fertilizer. And I, I can, I'm going to explain this later. And then if we look at the wounded leaves, you would see there's certainly no overlap between the blood and the bone meal, the miracle grow and um, control, like sort of like almost similar, there's an overlap. So now if we're looking at this figure, it should take our mind um, back to um, the essence of using fertilizers. So the essence of using fertilizers and then the effect um, wounding the leaves or not wounding the leaves is going to have on caterpillar growth. So now remember I mentioned earlier that wounding the leaves is 
going to um, trigger plant defenses. The plants will go into like an alert mode and we don't want the predator to feed on them. So that way they're going to produce genes like genes and chemicals that will ward off the predator. And that means that um, the caterpillars that will feed on those leaves wouldn't get the right, um, right amount of nutrients they would need. And definitely they're not going to grow optimally like the way they should if they were feeding well on them. So that's for the non-wounded leaves. And we can actually see that difference between the wounded and the between the wounded and then the non-wounded. Now the non-wounded, you will see there's like the um bar graphs are much higher, except for the control. And the reason is because um for the non-wounded, the caterpillars would have to do the job of you know eliciting that plant defense by by feeding on them. So by the time they start feeding on these leaves. It's going to take them like a while to like, oh, to recognize, oh, there's an invader. And then they start, um, and the non-wounded leaves like already have the right amount of nutrients. Like they, they don't have like preformed defenses, like waiting for those caterpillars on like the wounded category. So you will see that thing play out in their weights. Like the ones that fed on the non-wounded leaves, like fed a bit well before the plants or the leaves like elicited their defenses on like the wounded category. And then um, this figure here shows the percentage of dead caterpillars after feeding on the leaves from, from both categories, both the wounded and the non-wounded. And then um, this figure right here was actually supposed to check for cannibalism. And I'm going to show a graph that actually shows like the um, survival rate of the caterpillars. Because what I did was, um, as I said, was after um, transferring the caterpillars to solo corps that had different treatments, you know, the different treatments that we used. So I also did another one like with the corn diet just to check for cannibalism. And so I would come to count, like physically count the number of caterpillars left in each solo corp at 48 hours after two days, and I did that after 72 hours. So what I, or rather what we did was, um, um, the data we got, you would see um, some were missing, and the ones that were missing, like we assumed that they were cannibalized. But for the dead caterpillars, when you open the solo cup to inspect or count the number of caterpillars left in the solo cup, you're actually going to see like the dead caterpillar like on the leaves, but it was different for this, very figure because we we couldn't um actually um say what was responsible for the missing caterpillars and we sort of like then oh this could be cannibalism so now on the um artificial diet which was the corn based diet that caterpillars will naturally um feed on and grow you will see that the percentage of dead caterpillars is far lesser compared to the other treatments and this doesn't matter if the, if the caterpillar fed, um, we're feeding on non-wounded leaves or if we're feeding on the wounded leaves, it just didn't matter. Now, if we look, um, if we're comparing, you would see that the non-wounded control, the non-wounded blood, and then the wounded miracle grow had about, about like the same number of caterpillars, like, average number of caterpillars like that were dead. But we recorded the lowest for the artificial diet because there are no conditions here like that would, um, there are no con the conditions are just about right because that's what the caterpillar will feed on in this natural you know, environment. But it's different for this treatment cause the um, wounded leaves would trigger defenses. Of course, caterpillars won't be able to feed and meaning like if they're not able to feed, some of them die off, some of them cannibalize and start feeding on themselves. And then the non-wounded leaves like it's gonna be a different ball game entirely. Like they would feed, you know, and if they die, like that could be just maybe competing compet for the leaves. And we made sure that we are replacing the leaves after 48 hours. So would, each time I come to check the number of caterpillars, I would make sure to put like new leaves 
just to make sure that, and I will put that in every solo group to make sure like to sort of eliminate bias and say, okay, maybe this treatment didn't get enough leaves or, or this other one maybe got more leaves than the other one. So we made sure to replace um, the, the solo cups with leaflets to just to ensure that the caterpillars had food at all time. So now um, this figure shows the percentage of dead caterpillars side by side. And now this is without my artificial corn diet, which caterpillars naturally grow on. And then we're going to notice that, um, and this is for my non-wounded, and this is for my wounded. And you're going to notice that the percentage of dead caterpillars, we had like higher ones in miracle grow, and then our control that had no fertilizers. And this is quite understandable because miracle grow had or has um, a higher nitrogen content. And doing that is going to, we already mentioned like the downside of having like excess nitrogen amounts. And what that's going to do is that as it makes it um, succulent, the, the caterpillars will feed, yes, they should add some weight, but at the same time, like because it's an excess, the plants are also going to trigger the fences and then all this begins, the caterpillars begin to die off. And then if you look at the wounded category, you're going to see that we have the lowest for miracle grow. Bone and control had about like the same average number of caterpillars, you know, that died. So let me go to the next one to show you what I actually meant. So now this was, um, this graph here actually shows like the cannibalism that we're trying to see, um, to study, you know, for this experiment, like just to see if there's any form of cannibalism. And then this blue graph shows the number of caterpillars that were alive at 48 hours. And then the brown one shows the number of caterpillars alive at 72 hours. Now, if we look at this graph closely, you're going to notice that at 48 hours, the non-wounded miracle grow had higher number of caterpillars alive, but at 72 hours, you would see that drop. Now, you would see a dip at 48 hours for the caterpillars, you know, um, feeding on the non-wounded control, and then a further dip after 72 hours. Now, um, there wasn't, I would say there's a difference, but it doesn't look that it doesn't look significant for the um, caterpillars that were feeding on the wounded bone at 48 hours and then 72 hours. Then for this one, this is our wounded control. You would see here that this is about say, let's say 13 or 14. And then at 70, after 72 hours, you see that dip. At let's say um, this should be let's say around seven. So um, and all this is because you know they are not getting the right amounts, and then our control diet, of course, like there's no dip, but instead we'll see that um spike of the number of caterpillars, in as much as there's a, a slight difference, but it's not much compared to the other treatments. And so we could see that um, as the plants, what, what I make out of it is that as plants um, begin to elicit their defenses and discourage caterpillars from feeding on them, what that is going to mean is that, okay, so since the caterpillars can't feed on the leaves, they would turn to themselves to start eating themselves. And then, when they come to start eating themselves, I would say that's just like survival of the fittest. And the ones that survive the uh, the ones that survive the experiment like go on to live. But you're going to see that like play out. And so this shows like plant defenses on one hand, plant defenses like sort of like has a hand in cannibalism, especially for the ones that were wounded, because for wounding the leaves. You know, already wounding the leaves before feeding them to the caterpillars has already triggered plant defense genes 
and mechanisms, chemical pathways, you know, whatever it is that the plant needs to survive, even before feeding them to the caterpillar. So now feeding caterpillars with those leaves that already wounded, they already triggered plant defenses, even earlier, like before you fed them to the caterpillar. So you're going to see like defense, um, defense um, system, defense genes are like at on a higher alert, and it's going to be like way, way higher and discourage the caterpillars from feeding on, feeding on them, unlike the non-wounded category. So um, for my conclusion, um, we would need plants and tomato plants especially would need just about the right amount of nitrogen, and phosphorus, you know, to achieve a remarkable height. And then having um, excess nitrogen levels, as we see in Miracle Group, stunted their growth. And stunting their growth, sort of like, um, I'm going to show you some more picture, uh, some pictures, because like stunting their growth means like plants, um, the leaves were more yellow, it didn't look as green as the other treatments, the bone meal and the blood meal. The leaves didn't look succulent and attractive compared to the bone meal and the blood meal. And what that means is that like, okay, as the plants isn't utilizing like the nutrients, the way it's supposed to get, you're going to see it lose its value, the um, content, nutritional content of the plant or the leaves are, are very reduced as we're going to see miracle grow. I think I have pictures for that. Then um, we also see that the plants that were fertilized were better sources for nutrition for the caterpillars that were used in the study, unlike our control that had no fertilizer. Then um, we would also notice that plant defenses were reduced in the fertilized plants because um, fertilization, of course, is going to improve growth, make the leaves or the plants more attractive for caterpillars to feed on. And they would have fed on them for a little while before like, they start triggering their, before they start eliciting, you know, chemicals, genes, pathways, whatever it is, you know, to stop them from feeding on them. And then already wounding the, um, wounding the leaves, you know, ahead of time, even before feeding them, so caterpillars already mimic herbivory, like telling the plants, oh, something is beginning to eat you. And at that point in time, it's just natural for the plants, you know, to go into a defense mode and try to stop caterpillars from feeding on them. So this happening even before the caterpillars are feeding on those leaves is even going to further discourage the caterpillars from feeding on them because like the plant defense, um, defense is like on a high now and on a lot. So the caterpillars are not able to feed on them. And what that means is they're not going to grow the way they're supposed to grow and they're not going to gain the weight they're supposed to gain. So we would also notice that um, the survival rates for caterpillars, you know, for the um, graph I showed you, they were marginally higher, not like it was significant, because I'm sure maybe if maybe if we did this experiment like for a longer time or you know repeated it more, we would have maybe like noticed. But we also for this one, we actually noticed like the survival rates were actually like it wasn't too high, but it was high for caterpillars that fed on the non-wounded leaves than on the non-wounded leaves. And this could be because um the digestive system of the caterpillars are like are not being disrupted when they are feeding on the non-wounded leaves, unlike when they're feeding on the wounded leaves, because they already triggered feeding on plants that already triggered their plant defenses, is going to alter their digestive system. And so that way they're not able to absorb the right nutrients they would need to grow and gain weight. So these are my references. Thank you. Questions. I have a question. Okay. If you go back to the most recent bar chart that you have, I think it was, um, I don't know if it was caterpillar weight. Yeah, this one, dead caterpillars, I'm sorry. Um, you said something along the lines of it looks significant. Do you happen to know like your significance values for those? Um. Okay, so I did this experiment, um, or rather I analyzed using JUMP and Excel. And for my JUMP, 
when I did the analysis, you would see, um, oh, when I analyzed with ANOVA and Fisher's LSD, there was a statistical significance. So, you know, Fisher's LSD is just going to compare the means of these several groups and then it's going to assign values, maybe like A, B, if there's an overlap, like an A, B. So, if a plant has, I'm just giving you like what an ANOVA or Fisher's LSD is going to look like if there's a statistical significance. So when you're beginning to compare the means across the groups, if this group maybe has an A and another group has an A, that means there's no statistical significance. But if this group has an A being assigned, like when you compare the means of the several groups and this other um, treatment maybe like has a C, another one has a B, that means there's a statistical significance. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, you just don't have those on your graph in the, in the figure. I just was curious. Yeah. Dugo, could you go back um, a few slides to the, um, let's go, or if you can go back a few slides, please. Oh, okay. Um, is this under your results still? Um, could you go back? I'm trying to find the one where you have the caterpillars feeding. Okay. Um, so you get the average, okay, okay, let's just go through these real quick. The one thing I wanted, I think is important, it's kind of a take home that you might have just a really put an exclamation point on it, is when you look at across the board, you have your, um, you know, your blood, wounded, non-wounded, wounded, bone wounded, or non-wounded, wounded, you know, so forth and so on. <clears throat> Initially, it appears that the caterpillars grow really, really well on the fertilized plants when they're non-wounded. So it appears that non-wounded fertilized plants are more nutritious, have less plant defenses. But if you look at the non-wounded unfertilized plants, you'll see that the caterpillars aren't growing very well. You see that? Yeah. And you said this, but I'm just kind of maybe putting an exclamation point on this. And then when you wound the plants, if, if apparently well-fertilized plants that are wounded have a very strong induction of plant defenses. And we know that from just lots of other studies and our own studies that things like protease inhibitors will be stimulated. And this resulted in a drastic reduction in caterpillar growth on those wounded plants. But if you look at the without fertilizer treatment, you'll see there's almost no difference. So those plants are less nutritious, but they also are not able to put on a very strong plant defensive response. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, so the, the fertilized plants grow better. Initially, they're very edible, but then within 24 hours of being wounded, they, they their nutrition, nutritive level, nutritious level, or the plant defense level is such that the outcome for the caterpillars in some cases is even worse. If you look at the blood wounded, um, you know, the blood wounded, it actually has less growth than the unfertilized plants. So it mimics that um, reduction of nutritious state. Does that make sense to everybody? So you'll see that this is so much lower than these. But this is this would have been the exact same had it not been wounded. And that was within 24 hours we see this response. So there's a strong induced defense response in fertilized plants. You see the big drop off, but you don't see it here. But unfertilized plants, are less nutritious, but they don't have much of a plant defense response either. Now, the next step really is for us to measure those plant defenses and ver really verify what the levels have changed. And then we presume under these wounded conditions that perhaps there'll be more, um, you know, cannibalism and so forth. But we probably need to double check those kind of results as well. I, I do agree that the percentages maybe wasn't really a statistical data like these. These ones should have a, a p value though, right? Yeah. Did you, but you didn't, you didn't put it on this though? No, 
I didn't put them on the figures, but they are in my write up. Yeah, so they're, they're definitely a p value for these, but the percentages of caterpillars dead, I don't know if we did a, a p value because it was just a one. Does that make sense, everybody? And not to call you out on that, I, or but that's in regards to Ava, but just to be more accurate on that. This one definitely, I know you did p values on it, but the percentage ones, you wouldn't have had enough replicates. It's just a total percentage, right? So that would have been a chi square or something like that, I think. But this one, I know you did definitely had a p value, which we should have put on this graph, which is, I always blame myself as much. Um, what's your next slide look like? But do you, this is, I think this is the meat and potatoes, that slide. Everything else is a little bit more confounding to me, to be honest with you, when I look at it. That first slide you, we just talked about really makes a lot of sense. The other ones are, I think, are quite a bit more confusing. But now we're taking into account caterpillar behaviors and deaths and and so forth. <clears throat> anyway, is there a few more slides you could show? Then I'll let, open it up to anybody else that wants to ask a question. Um, percentage of death. Yeah, again, all really these are. What did you really? What was the take home message about this again? I was a little confused about this even. Um, that was cannibalism. Remember, we're trying to. Um... Oh, so you're saying there's more cannibalism on an artificial diet? No, there was less. Oh, living. Oh, so more caterpillars are living. Yeah. That's a little, but again, it's a little confusing based on those other results that we have. But okay. cannibalism, these cannibals are very, very easily going to cannibalism. Um, anybody want to ask a question? But I felt like that, if you go back to that one slide, I really feel like this is outside of the growth of the leaflets and stuff. The other thing I want to point out is your tomato fruits. Um, yeah. You know, you only talk about two or three tomato fruits per plant, but we're really talking, we haven't really gone into the fruiting season yet for these plants. So I don't think it's a really an accurate measurement, but the leaflets are big difference and so forth. So, yeah, so, but you can see there's a big difference in the growth of the plants. I'm surprised we see that many that much leaflets on an unfertilized plant, to be honest with you. But anyway, if you go back to that one slide one more time. Uh, yeah, and continue. Um, the caterpillar, this one I think really is your most important graph. It's clean. We have stats to work on it. Clearly fertilized non wounded plants. Initially, within like that first 24 hours that are good food source, but they drop off and become a bad food source as soon as the plant gets wounded enough. And interestingly enough, the white, you know, unfertilized plants just don't have the nutrients to stimulate a strong plant defense response, but they're not nutritious either. Did you measure recovery of leaves afterwards? No, but... um. I think I took a picture, but we didn't do like an actual measurement. Did you show your picture at the end? I think you were talking about doing that. Anyway, please let everybody else ask questions. I just wanted to really emphasize that this was an important slide to everybody. Yep, Ava just wrote a good job. Yep, you did a lot, especially being a nursing student and, and, a, and take care of a baby. That's a lot. Um, anybody else want to jump in? Thanks for your question, Ava. Does anybody else want to ask a question? Ready. Um, let's see, I'm gonna double check one more time. Well, if nobody else has a question, could we give a, an, a round of applause or thumbs up or however we do it on line nowadays? But anyway, Thank you, Dugo. You did a wonderful job. Um, I'm sure the committee is excited to visit with you. Um, why don't you take about a 10 or 15 minute break and then we'll start the defense. Okay. Does that sound good, Dr. Fiti Healy? Yes. <clears throat> yes. All right. So we'll start up about 1215. I know Sue's running off to grab Madeline. So. Okay. Yep. So just take a little breather, Dugo. <clears throat> Dugo. And then we'll uh, we'll get started. Okay, so thank. Yep. 
Thank you. And uh, all right, so well, I will. You can visit more with me, or I'll just leave the this online, or I can turn it off and restart in about ten minutes. Okay. All right. Um, the last person is Jomo. How do you pronounce your name? Anyway, you're welcome to sign off now. I'll go ahead and take host controls back. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and close the meeting and then we'll get a start back up.